So here we are in Froome 2015, a uh, show that uh, Kevin and well, maybe Kevin and I even uh, dreamed up last August uh, when we were in America together at another electric vehicle conversion convention there. And here we have a lot of converted vehicles today. Uh, it's been a super day. It's been really fun to come out and uh, see all of you, to uh, have the opportunity of showing what we've done in the meanwhile, and uh, now extra special to get an opportunity to tell you a little bit about the history of New Electric, uh, what my personal motivations have been so far, and especially also what uh, we're aiming to do in the near future. Um, but I want to join in with what Raphael said and just start off with a, a big thank you to Zero Carbon World and uh, Kevin Sharp, Karen Naden, Alex, who have just met finally today after all our time before and uh, say well thank you all so much for this warm reception uh, for a great day for a good plan and hopefully the start of what can be a, a new tradition uh, so a uh, big hand to Kevin and all the team thank you very much and then to uh, Mr. Raphael who you know I was just breathlessly watching your uh, show man you've got some cojones on you and uh, I'm really hoping to see a lot of people going for it next year and uh, you know I don't know but I want to join in <laughs> that's all I know <laughs> hey so New Electric started in 2008 I recently came back from America and I had seen the 2008 launch of the Roadster the Tesla Roadster a vehicle that did 0 to 100 kilometers an hour in 4.4 seconds and to my mind, that said a couple of things. One, I can't buy that car. Two, I would like to buy that car. But three, more importantly, that if you can do power to weight, zero to 100 kilometers an hour on batteries, that might mean we can go water skiing. Who's doing that? And the answer was, nobody. Why not? Couldn't we do that? And so my plan was with my little solar powered company, we did the solar panels in the day, was to find a place to have a shop and to build a electric boat that could take you water skiing. I thought it was feasible and I figured that with passion and an internet connection I should be able to read up enough, learn enough to um, reschool myself from the political science social psychology major to a, a budding engineer in electric technology. And so we went on. And at the time we figured um, and we, in that time, is uh, Raymond, myself, and Kevin. Kevin Zacher, my Kevin, not your Kevin, but all our Kevins anyways. And we figured that it would be possible and that we would have um, money for either good parts or a good boat, not both. So we found an old 1974 Glastron with a 130 horsepower Volvo B20 engine and we found an online resource called EVTV. And they were the only ones that were peddling real information and actual component information and not just internet vaporware. And we figured we would take these things and all our savings and a little more than that even and be the first ones to buy some lovely new batteries and some lovely new motors and see what would happen if you would stick them in. And that was our glass strong conversion with our first love, the Series DC motor. The Series DC motor is the best bang for buck still now and probably will always be the best way to take DC power from a battery and stick it into a motor and get the most torque out of it. Now it's got some limitations but power for price you're just never going to get anything better and uh, I will always love our Soliton and our first Kostov motor because it did some amazing things and to prove that point There may be some profanity involved. I'm American, please say. Tell the folks at home. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Raymond on his first run in his cool new boat. Onto the water skiing. I'm not sure I was a little scared. I'll admit. And that really was amazing. I mean, you know, beyond that, I was really expecting that we would build our first project, put it in the water, something would break, and we'd be back in the shop. We put this boat in the water in May of 2012. It did not come out until November. It worked every single day. We had fun all the way. And we just figured that if three guys from Amsterdam can do this thing that is not being done, the world needs to know. And this needs to become a company. We need to show other people and try and make something happen here. Uh, lead by example, but also have a lot of fun, really. And uh, so, like I said, I built a water ski boat, and it works! <laughs> you know, what's up with that? Um, but into doing something like this, there, there has to go some motivation. There has to be some reason, why did you think of doing something like this? And uh, um, like all good reasons, uh, things are very personal. For me, it was me and my wife uh, were expecting our first child, and it got me thinking a certain thing. Well, people ask me why did you want to build an electric speedboat? Um, I think you're pretty much looking at the reason. Uh, my wife and I heard we were expecting about two and a half years ago now, and you start thinking about some of the best stuff for your childhood, and uh, for me, being out in that fast boat was uh, definitely one of the highlights, uh, always was. And uh, you want to go check it out, Ben? Yeah? So, is it ready for snow? Want to go fast? Cool. Good. 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 And today? <laughs> There's a <the> smile. <laughs> <laughs> He's a little bigger now, and uh, we were lucky enough that he got joined by his sister and my wife, and that's on our cabin cruiser boat. So now you have your first speedboat. It's electric. It works. But it's an $800 glass run with $20,000 worth of electric parts. Not quite something you can give to someone else to sell. So we had our first challenge. How do you translate that experience, that pick up your seat, EV grin, amazing next level technology, and put it into a package that you can actually in, you know, invite other people to join the fun and uh, maybe build a company off of it. Well, the first challenge was to get someone excited, so I put some asses into the seat. And the second challenge was to get them in love with a vehicle that we could put it in. Enter the Silverback. This was a stranded project from 2007, a beautiful 1920s inspired runabout with mahogany decking and um, full aluminum body, 1500 kilos as she sits with the electric drivetrain in it. 
um, we found this project for a customer of ours that runs electric saloon boats in Amsterdam and he was looking for an upscale limousine option that he could run electrically quiet through the canals but full power behind the central station. We found this boat and were able to secure it and secure the first assignment for new electric to convert a vehicle from diesel, 130 horsepower, to full electric power. So we took the same system out of the Glastron, DC motor, Soliton, and some new batteries and we installed it for our first customer. And now the company started rolling and we didn't have a boat anymore, so we needed to find a new project. This is Franz Hein, our customer, rolling through the Amsterdam canals. And the right bottom, you just don't see it, but this boat has enough power that when you open up, it pulls out the bow thruster out of the water. It is an amazing ride. But then enters the Delta. Once again, Raymond and the new electric team worked his magic and found uh, an iconic, uh, beautiful classic design and something that we could work on together and uh, inspire hearts and minds to turn electric and to get stuff from new electric to do so. We started out with a air-cooled AC motor, so we're moving up the chain of technology from DC, which is basically battery power with a sluice gate up to motor power. Now AC is going to take your battery power and it's going to turn it into three phase and be a little bit more efficient about it and chase that rotor around its housing and give you that power. But at first we figured, hey, everybody's all into direct drive, all efficiency. You can't have a gearbox, you got to be direct drive. So we took a motor that had a Lotus motor, it was a Ford Kent Crossflow, it was a 1600 GT, and it had 84 brake horsepower, and it would turn that prop at 5,500 RPM. I'm like, hey, my motor does that, no problem. So we put it in direct drive, straight to it. And it worked, but it wasn't efficient at all. Because the thing is, with ICE motors, with internal combustion engines, we have so much power in the tank that the whole evolution of efficiency just wasn't happening. And we have 120 decibels, so who's worrying about vibrations or noise or that kind of thing? I'm deaf at the end of the day anyways. So it turned out that this really was not efficient way of dealing with that power. As pretty as the boat looked and as fun as it was to drive, I knew that we were missing something. And we needed to team up with somebody nautical, somebody that knew what they were doing, somebody that's in the room right now named Dick Hillis, who has 40 years of experience, and said, well, why don't we switch that baby around? So we turn the motor ass in, and we give it a reduction drive, and we make sure that the power goes through a belt to a heavier shaft and a much larger prop that's spinning at half the speed. And suddenly, instead of 40 kilowatts to go 40 kilometers an hour, we're doing 20 kilowatts to do 40 kilometers an hour. That's a times two efficiency increase. And finally, my boat didn't sound like an electric banjo, but it sounded like something that goes fast. And that was, that was the start for us to say, hey, we've got something that we can not only make people excited, but we can actually sell it to people and not have a headache of them coming back and saying, we're just not happy. And we get that range, because everybody had the range anxiety. Everybody in this room knows the first three questions are, how much does it cost? How long does it take to charge? How long can I drive? And you need good answers for all those three. You can, you can, you can be annoyed at the questions, but you just need good answers. We need to move beyond that question. This technology allowed us to move beyond that question. So we have an AC motor, we have a full drivetrain, we have a way of dealing with the batteries, and we have a good package to put it into. Now it's starting to feel like a company. Companies need commercial. Making electric boats isn't just making boats cleaner, it's making boats better. Being out in an electric boat means you can enjoy the environment you're in. You are so much more immersed in the sound and the experience of the aquatic life of the water, of the wind, than you would otherwise be. And it really gives you a new level of understanding and enjoyment of that generally beautiful nature you've gone into to enjoy yourself. What an electric motor does is that it gives you all this power in a vibrationless, soundless way. A well thought out, well designed system has 100% of the torque available all the time. You don't have to build up to it, you have it. So when you pump the throttle, you are out there and your whole shot is amazing. Uh, it 
takes your center of gravity right out from under you, and it gives people that what they call the EV grin. You just start laughing. You can't help it. You're so conditioned to think that you first need vibration, then need noise, and then you start going somewhere. And in this case, your center of gravity just shoots right out from under you. And uh, it's a wonderful feeling. You can still talk to each other. You're hearing the sound of the water and the wind and the waves instead of just hearing engine noise and vibrations. And it gives you really a chance to be in tune with that nature that you're actually out there to enjoy. Plus, not having to visit the pump is actually a great thing. Your battery will eat electricity from any source that you provide. I mean, who loves sitting around on their knees with a jerry can? We have better control over the boat. We have a better experience while we're out driving. Plus, we also have the knowledge that we're part of new technology. It is just way cool. Our mission is to make beautiful, fast, and fun electric boats. There's nothing more fun than taking these new technological developments and putting them into classic designs and having people shoot away with a big smile and an EV grin. And that's how we became New Electric, high-performance EV drivetrains. Of course, we can't just all be working and selling stuff to customers. We need to have some fun ourselves. So as I said before, uh, my son grew up, my family expanded. We needed a bit of a cabin cruiser. This is a seven-ton piece of metal with a formerly 22 horsepower Janmar motor. We put a DC motor in there, limited it to 30 kilowatts, and uh, gave it 30 kilowatts hours of batteries. Now we can take this boat five hours to the nearest set of lakes. That uses only 40% of that battery at three kilowatt continuous. We have enough battery for another three days of puttering around. You find one cord for one place to charge. You got another three, four days of boating around on you. It's like a magic carpet on the water. It is so smooth. Electric power on the water is a match made in heaven because it does not matter how modern your diesel engine is. It doesn't matter how well it's been cushioned on its foundation. Everybody on the ship knows the microsecond that the captain switches off that engine. <sighs> right there under your belly button. It is the quiet, it is the power, and for the captain that having power and torque at 150 RPM feathering yourself into the dock, it's a next level experience and it needs to be enjoyed by all. So on to the technology. Um, we are a company that's trying to do EV drivetrains. That means that we have to do not only the buying and selling of the components, but we need to know how we can support and service these components. We need to be able to put together a package that takes away the headache of finding the right battery with the right voltage of motor and the right settings on the controller. We need to not only package that in a way that you can put it into something, but we need to build it ourselves so that when somebody calls and needs some support, I'm like, hey, are you on page two of the settings? Because you need to go to that setting and that's going to help you out. Now for us to keep doing that, we always need to be building a project and we need to be finding people. Plus, we wanted to make sure that when the boating season is away, and, you know, our boating season is a couple of months at best in Holland, uh, we also need to be able to play on the road. So we were lucky enough to find a customer that fell in love with a ridiculous vehicle, a Jeep CJ5 from 1969, and uh, um, wanted us to put in an electric drivetrain. So this vehicle shows up, and for us it's a nice uh, 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 basic way to show how an electric vehicle comes together. So I won't go too much into detail on technology, but we'll go through the pictures and I'll let you know what it takes to put together an electric vehicle. It starts with taking out an engine. Now this engine was called the Hurricane. Guess what it sounds like? It's 120 decibels just running at stationary. Now it's out. Now she's in. This is a Siemens motor. It runs at 350 volts and we need to adapt her to make sure that we can use the original drivetrain clutch and uh, a transmission setup. Motor mounting. This motor's been adapted so that you put a little puck on the front. That means that you can put in the pilot shaft of any transmission and you can adapt the bolt holes to any standard flywheel. That means that you now become A, very adaptable to many different drivetrain setups and B, you're getting your electric motor and your transmission very close together. Now that's important not just for the power you're trying to transmit, 
but it's also really important for getting stuff in there because we've mentioned many times that it fits if I could just get it in there and we've been you know defeated by one thirty second of an inch many times over so having things close together gives you the power it gives you simple uh, adapter plates to machine and it gives you space to move stuff around Now, as we're getting towards the point where you're going to put in batteries, you start thinking about um, things of like road legal testing. And there's going to be an issue there. And for us to be an EV drivetrain company, once again, it doesn't mean just having the right components. It means that you have to secure for your customer the outcome. Now, the outcome is dependent on a lot of things, but mainly it's going to be dependent on getting through whatever version of road legal testing that you're facing. And I can tell you in Holland, we're facing the demon. <laughs> It is not, the system is not set up for individual builders. The system is set up to be a barrier to entry. It's, you're not meant to do this. Big factories are meant to do this. You're meant to buy stuff, not make it. So for us, we decided on this route that we would go with overkill wherever we could. Thick mountings for the batteries big boxes to put them in so we wouldn't have to uh, go through engineering tests and rollover tests and crash tests we could just point to three millimeters of 306 spec RVS stainless steel and say hey that box is not going to crush it will crush you you will not crush it And you need to document this stuff because you're going to have to send it to road legal testing and they want to see documentation in a certain style. A lot of electric components. We can get more into that for the nerds, but you can find me. You know where to get me. Hey, who's that coming on the scene there? We have a new member of the team, Celsa Manaya of Portugal. Maybe the only man in Europe, maybe the only man in the world that has a master's degree in lithium iron phosphate batteries. I mean, this guy, you cannot send him home. If you have batteries in a box, he just cannot help but bottom balance them, feather them, be nice to them, and send them out into the world and do good things. Thank you, Celsa. And Ray, working away in the little corners where nothing fits and you can only get bleeding knuckles. Happy times, late at night working against the deadline. That's a real shot. Things coming together. Time for that first drive. Look at that smile. You just can't buy that stuff. You can only make it. And there she's moving, ready to go to road legal testing. Now, in Holland, in all their wisdom, they had said that even though this is a 1969 vehicle, we're going to make her apply to all modern standards. So she had to do full road lane testing, what we call the moose test, 80 kilometers an hour, lane change, and we had to do full brake testing. This poor vehicle was made uh, with 50 kilos of brake pressure, and she was, uh, no, 70 kilos of brake pressure, and she was tested at 50. We had to, that, you're hearing all day, that's the brake assist, keeping up the vacuum pump. We just left her on to help you remind you that you know you might be up against proactive uh, regulations trying to keep you out of the game, but there is always a way. It might cost some money, it might cost some time, but there's always a way. Do not be disheartened. You can get even a 1969 Jeep CJ5 road legal in Holland. So if we can do that, you can do just about anything. And there she is. So that's us doing an individual build, but we want to make sure that we don't just change the world one car at a time, one project at a time that four guys in Amsterdam with a shop can do. We want to be part of, it's not just a product, it's a movement. So we want to be part of showing people how it's done and also be part of maybe you know shipping people how it can be done. So we have different drivetrain options. Now a drivetrain is many things coming together, but there's most important aspects is technologically having your components together, mechanically giving people a way to mount those components without you know, the endless pain of finding a CNC shop that'll work with you for anything under 7,000 euros or anything like that. 
And number three, certification. And that's going to be a big one. Our first love was the DC motor with the glass drawn. That was a big adapter plate, and we just took the, the um, damper plate off of a normal flywheel, adapted it to a coupler, and made it work with either a marine reverse or a bell housing that goes straight to a um, stern drive setup. Good enough for a first boat, but not quite refined. So once again, we found Achilles and we had a drivetrain set up with a reduction belt, something that we could actually design, build, implement, and then follow the new developments, oil-cooled motors instead of air-cooled. Now we're cutting into the next level, the next generation for the same money. We're doing more power. And now we're building it into systems for large-scale commercial operators. So we've gone from individual builds to something, a problem that we can solve once and then roll out many times. These are drivetrains, these individual units, and it's the same as the marine drive that we had set up today. This will re replace up to 150 horsepower of diesel. It can run 10 to 12 hours a day, and it can do so for years at a time. And that's because everything's been over-engineered to take away all those worries, all those questions that your customer or that our customer is going to have. How long will it run? Can I get security? I'm spending a lot of money on something new. Are people going to laugh at me? Will it go well? And we've all heard many examples of money spent and boats beached or cars not running or that kind of thing. And that is the detriment of this movement. We need to make sure that our examples that we put out there in the world are positive examples. Plus, we need to have fun and go on to the next project and not deal with headaches of the last. So here we have two marine drive systems. In the middle, it's a 144-volt um, hydraulic assist system that can be used for power steering for bow thrusters. So how is this made? We have a big base plate. We're going to give some secrets away here. So watch closely. We've got a base plate. We've got a big bearing housing that can make sure that no undue pressure or pulley or pull force is putting on the shaft of the motor. All that electric motor wants to do is turn. It doesn't want to push, doesn't want to have stuff hanging off of it. So you get a big bearing housing. You tighten it to torque specs. You get a big wheel for your reduction or you get a big planetary drive to make sure that the motor works as its spec and the prop works as its spec. You come put it together. And this is a very important step. We make sure that everything is aligned as it leaves the house because we're promising power. We're promising cycle life. And that means that you have to make sure that when it leaves your workshop or when it leaves your hands and into the customer's hand, you have to have something that can actually produce that power over time and not create headaches and bad calls from unhappy customers. And the only way to do that is to create drop and replacements, not parts, but drivetrains. And there she sits. Now it's not just the motor, but it's also the power electronics that are part of the certification process and a part of the, uh, the acceptation. So we have the controllers built into housing. Housing is built and shielded. And you deliver things with throttles, you deliver things with interfaces, you deliver things that are tested. You deliver battery packs that are pre-balanced, that have been pre-managed to make sure that all manufacturer defects are between you and the manufacturer and not between you and the customer, creating headaches for everybody down the chain. This also keeps smiling if you give them batteries. <laughs> and then you start delivering stuff to customers. So this marine drivetrain, we have five boats now in operation four in the water, one coming up, that are working in big canal boats in Amsterdam. So Amsterdam is now just like Bath here in England, it's part of the world heritage. And there is a lot of political will to say that the commercially operating canal boats become emission free and there's some new targets. Uh, 2020, there's some targets in 2025 that between, between now and the next 10 years, over 450 commercially operated boats need to be full electric and emission free. And we intend to do a good part of that market. We've got the first four going in the first three months of this year, and uh, the sky's the limit. So you bring it to the shipyard, and it goes into a boat like this, for instance, the Jakob van Lennep, a 40-person canal boat that has fine dining, 
and goes along the canal and used to have ruining your experience. And what does it do now? Smooth sailing. Give me an extra drink. Here's another shipyard building a brand new boat. Can you imagine that this size of motor pushes this size of boat? But that's the way it works now. If you have all the torque and you have all the cooling, you don't need more than that. Except for one thing. You need certification. And this barrier to entry is being put up and it's being making small shops and small manufacturers think that we cannot play in the big game. That your name has to be Audi or your name has to be Ford to be able to play in the big games. And I thought so too, until my eyes were open to the fact that for a mere, let's call it 7,000 euros in two months of your life, which is a significant investment, but you too can get a drivetrain certified. Because we've been talking about OEM components coming onto the market. But the thing is, if you're going to put a commercial operating boat or if you're going to put a car on the road in mainland Europe, you need permission from the drivetrain owner to take their certification and use it on the road. And they're not going to give it to you. But the funny thing is you can take their components, make it a drivetrain and get it certified for a certain price and a certain amount of investment in energy and knowledge. But that means it becomes a transferable certificate that I can give to a builder or a shipyard or any one of you building a car and we can get you certified. So they take these motors and they put every known band to man of frequency and gigahertz at it and they make sure that there's no RPM effects and then they turn it around. They receive everything, making sure that your drivetrain is not going to put grandma's you know, pacemaker on haywire. And if you did well, you end up with one of these. Test report concerning the compliance of an AC motor with controller brand HPVS models HPVS blah 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 blah. Requirements of the United Nations regulations ECE are 10-4. I don't even know what it means, but I paid for it and I can make your car go really fast because of it. I'm happy. And because we have the certification, because we have a drivetrain that showed itself both in a power boat application and a working boat application, we were able to install it, you know, now with four different commercial operators. And at the most recent Amsterdam Boat Show, we were invited to show our stuff, not just as a you know paying exhibitor, which we were, but also as a nominee for product of the year. So this is us, year two at the boat show. Year one, I have a converted boat and a few loose motors. Year two, we have a newly built boat and a fully certified drivetrain, which is nominated for product of the year. Okay, we didn't win the product of the year, but hey, being nominated in this stage of the game, for us, that was winning. We had a lot of extra attention and our first customers, our launching customers for this product, were being uh, rewarded for their choice to choose, you know, a small company of young bloods wanting to change the world and, you know, not being laughed at, but actually being rewarded by the fact that that product is being, you know, nominated as product of the year. So it was a proud moment. So that's all good stuff, but we didn't really start to necessarily make a million bucks. We started because we believe that we can have a lot of fun creating a company that is not just a product, but it's a movement. It's a lifestyle. It's a way of saying, hey, there's new technology out there and let's enjoy what we're doing. We all need to live the life. You gotta wake up every day, do stuff, go to bed, rinse, slather, and repeat. That's where this comes in. I was there and I still can't believe it. Let's look at that again. is next level. That out of hell. <laughs> I can't get over it. So we have a 1966 Ray Wright Delta. It was built at Beckles Airfield in Suffolk, UK. It was the next generation of a boat of the 50s, the Albatross, which was known to be uh, owned by Jack Unassis, Prince Phillips. It was just a time of water skiing coming up for the first time. 
It was a small company at an airfield in the UK that had a contract in the Second World War to build Spitfires and the like for the RAF going after the Luftwaffe. But after the war, no more Luftwaffe, no more contract. What do these people do? They start building speedboats, God love them. And they create this line of speedboats, two-seater aluminum racers, um, and for a while it was the fad, and then it went away again. And we found one of these boats, we built it, we converted it, we used it, and we thought it would be an example of a drivetrain. We thought it would be our marketing budget for getting this drivetrain out there. But it turned out a lot of the attention was going to the boat itself. There's a certain amount of passion that is ignited by a truly impractical vehicle. <laughs> Something that is made because the kids don't fit in it. And uh, we were egged on enough by our partners and contractors and other people around us that we should actually build this boat that you've all now seen today because it's standing behind you and that's number two number three is on the way and this is a going concern once again CE marked and you know we're we're an actual manufacturer now who would have thought so you draw new lines and you draw new plans and you find a boat builder that can actually deal with this stuff and you cut aluminum into plates and a lot of welding and stuff that is a whole career unto itself happens and something starts coming together and an idea which was neutrons in your head firing randomly percolate starts taking shape in reality starts coming out takes little details like Morris Minor fan club boot hinges because <laughs> everything good for boats comes out of something great for automotive and it starts looking shiny it starts looking real good it's uh, speechless to me and that's what we were showing just this last March at the HISFA, early this March, because this boat just came out. And we want to use this boat not just as a vehicle for us to have a you know, consumer model that we can proactively market and all that good stuff that we want to get investment and we want to sell things, but it's still a product. But it's also a movement. And we want to ignite hearts and minds. We want to find things that we can do that not just better the cause of new electric, but they better the cause of electric drive over internal combustion drive. And so, me and my big mouth figured out that if you have a boat that can do 40 kilometers an hour at 20 kilowatts output, and you have more than 20 kilowatt hours in the boat, maybe you can go really fast for over an hour. And what would be the right kind of distance to do something useful with that amount of power to weight ratio? Maybe you cross the English Channel. So we figured that if the English Channel is 38 and a half kilometers port to port, that maybe a boat that can do over 38 kilometers an hour for more than an hour could do it under an hour. And wouldn't that be really cool and something to ignite not just intention for us, but attention for this eternal question that's there, which is how long can you run it, how long does it take to charge, and yada, yada, yada. If you can take a small boat, go fast across the ocean, or some part of it anyways, within an hour, and set a record, that could maybe ignite some attention. Once again, not just for us, but also for the movement. And we have another special gentleman here in the hall, Mr. Alfred Gaeta of America, that actually went to the Guinness people. And he wrote to them and in such detail and such persistence that they said, all right, sir, you guys can make an official attempt. So it would have been fantastic if I was here right now saying that that boat behind you had actually crossed the English Channel which it did on the ferry, but had done so under its own power. Of course, planning to do an event like this, needing perfect weather, but doing it late March, you know, between France and England, a bit of hubris there. Um, but no fear, we are definitely doing this thing. It will probably be in June, July. We need some warmer weather. We need a perfect week and we will cross the English Channel. And anybody here that thinks that this is a cool thing or that you want to be involved in any way, I would say please contact me. Please become a part of this party. Uh, we're going to 
set this record, it'll become a published record, it'll be something that we can invite other people to challenge, we can challenge it ourselves, we can show the world that it's not just a one-off, it's not future technology, it's something that's happening right now, it's something that is powerful, it's fun, it's cool to join in, it's not because we're saving the world in a way that you're supposed to be ashamed of your V8, no, there's cool new toys and you can play too, come join the fun. And we will take this English-inspired heritage boat, and it'll be powered by an electric American motor and Chinese lithium cells, and it'll be piloted by this little Dutch guy, bringing tidings of new electric power that can power a next generation of watercraft. So I bring you the Delta, and I bring you new electric, and I thank you very much for all your attention. Thanks, guys.